well, rather than do Weird Indiana today, I'm switching it up a little bit. Today it's Weird Anywhere. <laughs> and today I want to tell you about my monastic community that I have been a part of since 2002. St. Bridget of Kildare Monastery. Now you may be saying, where is this place? Well, it's right down the name, y'all. Anywhere. <laughs> you see, in 1988, the General Conference of the United Methodist Church met. And one of the briefs that came through, one of the legal briefs that came down to the conference was this question. They said that they wanted people to, um, they wanted folks to study the connections between Methodism and monasticism, being a monk in a monastery. And of course, it got voted down in legislative committee. And so it wasn't even going to go to the floor. But someone said, you know, I really think I would like to see this come down to the floor so that all of us can vote on it rather than just this little committee. And it passed. It, it was pulled off the, the calendar. It was taken down to the main floor. And the person said, here's why I wrote this, and here's why I think it's a good idea. And, he told, and on the face of it, doesn't it seem a little strange? Catholic, monasteries, Protestant, Methodists, right? But if you think, but if you know a little bit of the history, you'll find that that most that monasticism and Methodism actually have a lot in common. You see, way way back in around the year 317, there was this gentleman by the name of Saint Benedict, so called because he's been sainted. Now, Benedict was a, a student in Rome, probably the son of, of a wealthy family, and uh, he was he was in Rome, and while he was there, he sort of had a conversion experience. And he looked around Rome, and he saw that people weren't really holy. You know, the church people weren't very churchy. Now, this is actually by design, because around the year 300, um, that's when, when, um, that's when uh, the um, persecutions of Christians ended by law. And they actually declared that Christianity was the new religion of the Roman Empire. So Christians stopped being fed to lions and, and, and killed en masse. And what happened instead is, in order to be a good person in government, in order to make it your promotion, you needed to also become a priest. So people without ha having any calling from God at all became priests and church leaders so that they could also become leaders in church and government. There was no separation of church and state in these days. And so what Benedict looked around when he saw, he saw a bunch of people who weren't called to ministry, weren't called to be leaders in the church, being leaders in the church. And the corruption that came as a result of it was pretty strong and pretty demanding, right? And he, so he decided, I'm going to leave this place and I'm going to seek a truly holy life. And so he walked out of Rome, and he left, and he went to a place, and he became a hermit. And there he continued to pray and to study the scriptures, and created for himself a very strict and demanding lifestyle. Well, pretty soon, some local monks heard about him, and they said, We need you to come to the church, come to our monastery, and be our leader, our abbot, our father. And Benedict said, I don't think you'll like me very much. I'm very strict. And what do you know, folks? He was right. He went into their monastery and he was so strict with them, they tried, to, they tried to poison him. They gave him a cup of poisoned wine and as he blessed the cup, the cup burst open. And he said, go and find yourselves an abbot that you like. And he left. And pretty soon his entire life was, was sort of wrapped around this idea. And pretty soon he, he, he kind of calmed down a little bit. He kind of became more moderate. And eventually he wrote a rule for monasteries. And this rule book was, was there to help people, lead people to a more godly life. And so he started gathering these monks together, and then he gathered those, those, the, the monastery into deaneries, and together these people were devoted to spiritual practices. And next thing that happened is, is that people who were, who were lay people, who weren't wealthy aristocrats, who weren't people who, who had all the money in the world, they could actually go to the monastery and learn to read scriptures for themselves. And monasteries became places that soon became universities and places where people, where lay people such as yourselves could, could go to the monastery and learn, offering education to people en masse in a way that had never been done before. You know, the Dark Ages were called the Dark Ages for a reason. No one was educated. And so Benedict created a system in which people, both monks and priests and lay people, could all become, have an education and a founding in Christian thought 
a founding in Christian belief, right? That's a powerful moment, and his desire was that people would gather together in holy groups. Now let's fast forward a few hundred years to another man who found his way into the church, John Wesley, the founder of Methodism. And if you think about it, things were largely the same. The Church of England had just been established, right? It was the, it was the national religion of England, right? And John Wesley's looking around and he's saying, I don't see much holiness here. I see a lot of people who are using their positions and, their, and the aristocracy to, to kind of keep other people down. And what I want to do is I want to gather people together in groups. This sounds so familiar. I want to gather people together in groups, and I want them to learn about God together, and I'll form them together in little bands and classes. And once I do that, they'll start doing good works in their neighborhoods, and they'll be a blessing to the, blessing to the community. Have you heard this somewhere before? Did I say this part already? And so John Wesley gathered people together around spiritual practices, around acts of mercy, around goodness. Does that not, do they not sound like brothers to you? Benedict and, and Wesley? They both wanted holiness for their entire community, for their entire world. John Wesley said it best, I want the world to be my parish. And so this person who wrote this brief at the General Conference saying, let's study the connections between Methodism and monasticism, let's see how they chime. They found, guess what, that it chimes really well. So once it passed, what has to happen? Somebody has to actually do the work, and it filtered down to our various boards and agencies until it landed on the desk of the good people at the upper room. And so they're like, well, in true Methodist fashion, well, let's form a committee. <laughs> so uh, there was a professor, there was a professor at, uh, at Garrett Evangelical Seminary at, uh, over there, and uh, he, uh, he was a professor, his name was Father Timothy Kelly. He was a Benedictine monk from St. John's Abbey. Famous the world over in Roman Catholic circles for his, for his knowledge, for he just is really a famous person. And um, he was serving as a, as a professor at um, Garrett Evangelical. And uh, wouldn't you know it, one of his seminarians came to him and said, okay, here's what I think. I'm a Methodist. And she said, I don't want to become a pastor, but I do want to become a monk and be a Methodist. And Father Timothy Kelly laughed at her because the day before, the good people at the upper room had called him and asked him to be on this committee to study Methodism and monasticism. So after tremendous education, uh, Mary went, went and stayed with the sisters in Clyde, Missouri. And I, I don't know the whole timeline here, but eventually what she did was she founded the first Methodist Benedictine Monastery, based on Benedict's principles, based on John Wesley, and she named it St. Bridget of the Monastery. St. Bridget was an Irish saint who created a double monastery of both men and women who gathered together in, in, in Ireland. Now, let's fast forward again to 2001. And a guy you know was a little pudgy around the middle. <laughs> But it's really funny. Well, he, uh, he, got, he was in his first week in seminary, and they had this computer message board where the people talked and argued back and forth on. And I'll tell you, it was really just a cesspit of argument and, and debate. I really learned to hate it after that first week. But it did do one good thing in my life. Someone randomly posted an article about this new Methodist Benedictine monastery, and I thought, that sounds neat. I want to know more about that. And so I started, and I, I contacted Mary, and I spoke with her. And in those days, she had, uh, she had, it was, the monastery consisted of herself and one other person. I'm going to move to the pulpit, actually, because this, this is cutting in and out. We, we're on. Let's just switch to this mic, Georgia. Gorgeous Georgia. I'm going to turn this off, too. So I contacted her, and she told me more about St. Benedict, and I saw, because I was in Wesley Studies courses, how much they chimed with each other. And I thought, you know, this, this rhythm of daily prayer, this, this idea of, of consecrating parts of your day, and sort of being really connected to the story of Jesus, this, this is what I need, because I'm a really flighty person. They, uh, they have these prayers for different personality types, 
and I'm an ENFP, and they say that, that my personality type is, Dear Lord, help me pay attention when I pray. Oh, look, a bird! <laughs> and that is the reality. That is truly who I am. You all may have noticed this when you're talking to me. I'll be totally listening and totally engaged, and then you will have said something that has me on a brain train just somewhere else. You know? And I can't help it. I really can. I try really hard, and, and I've, 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 I've honed my skills a lot. But there is this sense that I have a delightfully random brain. And so as, my, as the story unfolded, St. Bridget's became a bigger part of my life. I went to our first retreat. There were basically five of us there. And, and I've done this now for, for 12 to 14 years. And, and I, I have to tell you, it's meant a lot in my life. And I wanted to tell you all this because something happened at this year's retreat. You probably heard a little bit about it, but I thought I'd just tell you exactly what happened because it has led me to a, to a new spiritual place that I wanted to share with you. So here's what happened. I woke up um, that morning, and I'm, I'm going to try not to be gross or anything, but it, it's just it's a gross, kind of gross story. I woke up that morning um, to go to the retreat this year. You all remember I, I you know, was going to leave. And I woke up, and um, I'll say in the swimsuit area, I found a little cyst of some kind. I brand new, hadn't seen it before, washing, and I found it. And I thought, well, I'm going to have to have that looked at when I get back. I didn't panic, didn't worry, you know. I got in the car, I drove for 10 hours. And uh, I got out at the guest house for the monastery retreat. I got out of the car, and the heat hit me, and I was on fire. I had alarm bells going off in my mind. I was like, oh, I, I, I'm dying right now. I thought, I'm, I, I can't even, I, I'm going to pass out right now from this terrible heat. Now, what had happened before was I had been in the car with the air conditioner running right at me, but as soon as I stepped out in that heat, I knew something was terribly, terribly wrong. Now, I'm going to pause in my discussion for a moment. Brothers, you just sit tight. We need to talk to our sisters for a moment. <laughs> sisters. I have been told that there's a certain point in a, in a woman's life where she goes through a change of some kind. <laughs> and that with that change comes these moments where you feel waves of heat coming on you. Now I dare not claim that what I went through was anything akin to what you could go through. But if it's even close, I'm so sorry. <laughs> On behalf of the Y chromosome, I deeply apologize. <laughs> because that was terrifying and miserable, and I will pray for you. <laughs> Brothers, come back in. <laughs> I walked to the retreat center, and I checked in. And I thought, I've got to get down to my bedroom, and just, just, I just have to. I went in, and that little cyst that was about this big was now the size of my fist. And I had a fever and I was really sick, and I just felt bad. And so I walked upstairs, I found Mama Mary, the leader of our monastery, and I said, I'm gonna just cause drama in the first five minutes I've been here, <laughs> and tell you I need to go to the hospital. And so one of, the, one of my sisters, Sue, took me to the hospital and waited with me in the ER. And uh, pretty soon I was checked in, and pretty, the next day after that I was supposed to have surgery. And I spent a lot of time in that hospital room. And uh, I wasn't at the retreat, and I missed it, and I was in a bad mood. And I was, and I was talking to God about it, and God was not very nice. I said, God, why is this happening? He said, well, uh, you, you, haven't made, you haven't been making it to community prayers very often. For with St. Bridget's, have you? You haven't been calling in to pray with the people in your breviary, so why should you get to do it now? Well, Lord, I've been very busy. You know, that church that you put, you saddled me with, it takes a lot of time. <laughs> and so and God and I had this discussion, and we talked about it, and I, he said, well, you made it to all the special evenings for the feast days and those sorts of things, but you didn't make it to, to common daily prayer. You know the way you're supposed to be living your life. God was not very nice. And yet, God was so kind and so gracious. After my, before my surgery was over, I got a phone call from the folks at the retreat center. And this is what they said to me. This is, it's incredible. They said, 
well, Michael, here's our plan. We know that you're not going to be able to drive home by yourself because you're going to be on narcotics. So here's what we're going to do. Um, we're, uh, you know, Janet and Adrian drove their camper here. And so Adrian's going to be spending her time with you. Um, she'll come to visit you at the hospital. She's going to be using your car to get back and forth. And um, also, uh, Chris uh, is going to drive your car home in four days. And you're going to ride home in Adrian and Janet's camper so that you can sleep and rest all the way home. Is that OK with you? Uh, uh, I hadn't even thought about it, but they did. Then they decided that while they're at the retreat, they were going to send me goofy little goofy little videos. So they sent me goofy little videos. I'll show it to you now. Just <laughs> My friend Mary Lynn is here from Michigan. She's all the way in the back. And uh, she's, uh, she's one of the ones who sent me silly videos, so I just wanted to scare her a little bit. <laughs> and as I was sitting there, and I was thinking about that, and all the things that they had already done without my asking, it reminded me of a retreat where, where Bev Selby, one of our members, said, "You don't."